Calling All Cars, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast six regarding a holdup on Terminal Island just before noon. There's two bandits. Number one, dark complexion, Mexican or Filipino, about 20 years of age, wearing a dark suit and gray cap. Number two is also dark, wearing a gray suit and gray cap. These men may be heading north toward Los Angeles. Keep your eyes open, boys. That's all. Rolls and quick. Mrs. Hazel Berg, living in Hollywood, is awakened at 2 a.m. by the ringing of her telephone. Hello? Goodbye, Hazel. This is Virginia. I've turned on the gas. I'm dying. But before I leave this world, I hate so much. I, I wanted to say goodbye to you. <laughs> goodbye, dear. Oh, hello? Hello, Virginia. Hello. Oh, operator. Give me the police department. Quick, this is an emergency. Quick, please. Also, please calling car 42, car 42. A woman committing suicide with gas at 7566 North Edinburgh in Hollywood. That's us. Let's go. Less than a minute after the emergency call was received by the police department, radio policeman crashed down the door, gave Virginia first aid treatment, and saved her life. A few seconds longer, and it would have been too late. And because the police meet hundreds of emergencies like this every day, when seconds saved mean the difference between life and death, they specify Rio Grande cracked gasoline to power more police and emergency cars than any other brand. This emergency gasoline galvanizes into action at the touch of the starter. It accelerates so much faster than ordinary gasoline. Police and emergency car drivers in Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, and many, many other cities, as well as deputy sheriffs in Maricopa County, Arizona, and many other counties where great distances must be covered at top speed, all swear by Rio Grande cracked gasoline as the fastest, most powerful, most efficient gasoline they have ever used. And every day, scores of motorists who try Rio Grande cracked gasoline for the first time get the thrill of police car performance in their own cars. And now it is our pleasure to introduce Chief of Detective H.S. Seeger of the Los Angeles Police Department, Chief Seeger. Good evening, friends. The law enforcement problems of the Los Angeles Police Department are complicated by the large colonies of foreign language-speaking people in our city. These people do not always understand the work of our police officers. When our department attempts to solve a crime occurring in one of these foreign colonies, we meet many difficulties, as you will hear tonight. It is hard to make our mission understood and it is even harder for our police officers to understand the meager explanations in a foreign tongue. Despite these handicaps, there are mighty few unsolved crimes of any magnitude. Our detectives must merely work harder and longer tracking down clues. Eventually, we always get the culprit. Tonight's case is a typical of the disadvantages under which our police work. The description of the bandits was so vague it seemed almost impossible that we could even locate them. The story of the missing Mexican sheiks that you are now about to hear is typical of the almost superhuman diligence of your police officers in working out a successful conclusion to a case that had no clues. <laughs> It is late morning of February 5th, 1930. 
Mrs. Taki Nago, as is her custom, visits her branch bank on Terminal Island in Los Angeles Harbor. Good morning, Mrs. Nago. Oh, good morning, Fritz. What will it be this morning? Oh, I think I take out money today. All money in bank. Oh, today is your big banking day, isn't it? Oh, yes. Today, many fishermen, many canary men, he pay off. He, he come eat at my extra special number one restaurant. And you cash the checks, is that it? Yes, I think, baby, I think for them. Well, I can see what you get out of it. Making oh. a bank for those boys. Oh, very fine man. Extra special. Come find Japanese fisherman. Come number one American fellow. Give money. Spend money. Last money in my um, restaurant. Well, from what they tell me, they'd come anyway to eat your cooking. Oh, you hear? I cook very good. Well, that's what they tell me. Oh, very fine. You come to my place. I feed you something nice. Oh, you, you like some special seaweed? Hmm? Seaweed? <laughs> well, not exactly. Maybe so. You like fish. Oh, very good fish. Is it? Maybe so. Eight months old. <laughs> you like? Well, I don't know, Mrs. Dago. You see, I'm not used to oriental dishes. Well, here's your money. $1,000 in 10, 5, and $20 bills. Oh, yes. There's $100 worth of one. Oh, you, you count him. Is they all right? Yes, I counted it. It's right, just $1,000. Oh, very good. Now, be careful of that money. Oh, yes. I careful. I hold tight in hand. All right. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. And you not forget, I made special number one Japanese dinner for you. <laughs> all right, Mr. Nago. I'll drop in and see you someday. As Mrs. Nargo leaves the bank and walks down the street toward her chop suey restaurant, a sedan which has been parked across the street makes a U-turn, passes the little Japanese woman and comes to a stop a few feet ahead of her. A young man gets out and stands with one foot on the running board, talking to his companion at the wheel as Mrs. Nago approaches him. Then, just as she is passing... Give to me that money. <coughs> Keep your mouth shut, you. Oh, oh, give oh, stop, stop. Get to the board. Oh, stop. It's your money. It's your money. Come on, let's go. Come on. Oh, Ten for the registered letter. Twenty cents in all. Oh, Miss Gordon. Shopping man. Shopping man. Well, what's the matter, Mrs. Nogg? Oh, my dear money. Oh, money. I oh, have. Oh, you grab money and run away. You're shopping for me. What's this? Someone stole your money? Yes, all money in the world. He got it. He him from me. You stop him. You work for government. You stop him. Oh, but Mrs. Nogg, I can't stop him. I only run the post office. No, no, no. You work for Uncle Sam. You can't stop him. Please. Please stop Now, look, Mrs. Nogg. Pull yourself together. I can't do anything about it. But you run over to the fire engine house across the street. Please? Right over there, to the fire engine house. And you tell them, and they'll call the police. They, they do. Yes, now hurry, now hurry. Oh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, I'll go Oh, my boy. You never should have left an opening like that. One, two, three. There, make that a king. There's two more. That wipes you off the board. Yeah, I guess you got me that time. Hey, look at that Jap woman streaking across the street. Oh, that truck now we got her. Oh, here's my fireman. You help. You help me. I find very great trouble. What's that? A man here grabbed money from my hand. He ran away fast in out of a deal. What's that you say? You've been robbed? Yes, yes, I robbed. All money in wrong. I got no more money. Please, you're stopping. You made money from my back. How much money did he take? Oh, maybe so I think thousand dollars. Thousand dollars? What did he look like? Oh, oh he dark. I think he maybe so Mexican. How was he dressed? Great. What did he wear? He, he wearing gray suit, cap too, I think. What kind of a car was it? Street. What kind of a car? Oh, oh automobile. Yes. Maybe so, right green. Anybody with him? Yes, he has a friend. Friend drive car very fast. What did the friend look like? Oh, he makes a come through, maybe. He wear dark suit, cap too, I think. And which way did he go? Oh, down that way. Mm, toward the drawbridge. You think you'll find him. You're stopping him, maybe so. Big black, my money. Well, ma'am, I'll do the best I can. Give me the drawbridge. Hello. Harry? Christ, at the engine house. Say, Harry, a couple of Mexicans just pulled a strong arm job down here and got away with a grand. Lift that bridge of yours, will you? Yeah. Yeah, I want to hold up all the traffic from the island until the dicks can get over there from San Pedro. Yeah, I'm going to ring them right away. Cap 
Captain A.L. Gentry and Detectives Evans and Dunphy answer Captain Price's call. Dunphy is detailed to keep a lookout in San Pedro for the car and occupants answering the Japanese woman's description. And Captain Gentry and Evans cross to Terminal Island on the ferry. At the open drawbridge, a long line of irate motorists greet them with honking horns as they are joined by officers George Finn and C.H. Hydley from the Wilmington Station. Hello, Captain. We've been waiting for you. Hello, Finn. Got here as soon as we could. Hey, come on. Let's get going. All right. You'll be moving in a minute. Yeah, it's about time. Yeah, they're getting sort of restless back there, aren't well, they? Well, a little delay won't hurt them any. Now, here's what I want you men to do. Yes, sir? We'll drop the bridge. Then sit this line of cars and trucks up. Get the license number and description of every car and the name and address of every occupant. Yes, sir. And if you find a light green sedan with two Mexicans or Filipinos in it, one dressed in a gray suit and the other in blue, both wearing caps, arrest them and bring them in. Right. I doubt if you'll find them in this lineup, though. The chances are they've abandoned the car. Evans and I are going to take a look around the island and see if we can locate it. where the great liners lie moored after their journeys from the Orient and the South Seas and up and down the docks where scrubby tuna clippers sway at their moorings, Gentry and Evans search for the robbers. Their hunt leads them past warehouses that smell of cargo from far places of the earth and through streets where the fishermen are drying their nets, past canneries and past lumber freighters. Finally, as they turn into Seaside Avenue... Say, hey, Captain, this might be it. What? Well, you see that sedan down there? Parked right in the middle of the street. Both front doors are swinging open. Yes, sir. See, we'll have a look at that. No. No, that couldn't be it. The description is light green. This car's blue. Oh, that don't mean nothing. That poor Jap woman was probably so scared she couldn't tell the difference between light green and dark blue. Come on, let's have a look. Okay. Mm, looks like somebody left it in a hurry. Yeah, they've been running it fast. That radiator's hot. Who's it registered to? Mm, let's see. Now, you might know it's a rented car. California Auto Park in San Pedro. I'm going to ask that woman over on the porch there if she saw anybody in the car. Okay. Uh, pardon me, ma'am. Do you know who owns this car? No, sabe. Did you see anybody leave it there? Si, dos hombres. Two men, eh? Si. What'd they look like? Were they uh, Mexicans? Maybe. How were they dressed? One, he wear gray suit. Other, he wear blue. Well, did they wear caps? Si. You know him? No. Do you? No, sabe. Do they live around here? No, sabe. Well, ever see him around before? No, 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 sabe. Well, that's good enough. Thanks. Well, Evan, her description tallies. I guess this is the buggy we're looking for. Yeah, a lot of good it'll do. These mugs didn't give the right names when they rented it, I'll bet. Well, we'll follow it up anyway. I'm going to phone the California Auto Park and see who rented this car. In the meantime, you'd better dust and photograph what fingerprints you can find. Right. The auto park manager informs Captain Gentry that the car was rented by one J. Colano of 8328 Street, San Pedro. On the way back from Terminal Island, the detectives checked this address and discover that it's a school building. They return discouraged to the San Pedro police station to determine their line of action. Well, we're pretty much up the well-known tree. Pony address, pony name, without a doubt. And they didn't catch a shadow of a suspect while they were sifting at the drawbridge. Those birds must have abandoned the car and come over to town on the foot ferry. Ah, uh, they're probably miles away by now. You're forgetting one thing, Gentry. What's that? Those prints I photographed this afternoon. Yeah, if the guys have ever been up before, well, they may help us. Well, anyway, it's not as bad as it could be. Huh. Oh, hello, boys. Hello, Sebastian. How's the merchant's patrol? Okay. I dropped over from the island to get the latest dope on the crime. Well, there isn't much dope. We found an abandoned car with some prints on it. Well, that's something. I've been up at the bridge with the boys checking cars. Uh, you didn't have to do that. You're paid to guard warehouses, not to do our work for us. <laughs> well, I wanted to get in on the excitement. Yeah, from all I hear, there wasn't any. <laughs> not very much. But I thought I'd drop over and give you some dope I got on a hunch. Mm -hmm. Still playing hunches, Sebastian? Yeah. Sometimes they're a good idea. 
Well, I don't know whether this is worth a nickel to you, but a few days ago, I saw a couple of Mexican sheiks over on the island that were dressed like the ones described in this holdup. Yeah? What were they doing? Oh, they were innocent enough. Had a couple of girls with them. And they were taking pictures. But here's where the hunch comes in. Somehow, they didn't look on the up and up to me, so I took the license number of the coop they were driving. I got it here someplace. You want it? Sure. Oh, here it is. Here. Five Edward one four nine five. Now, wait a minute. I took down that number again while I was checking at the bridge. I'm sure I did too. Wait till I look at this other list. Yes, sir. Here it is. Five Edward one four nine five. Chrysler coupe with two Mexican dames in it. Yeah, here's their name. Dolores Gonzalez driving, accompanied by Mona Martinez. Both employed by the Gold Star Fish Cannery. And they live up on 8th Street near the school. Yeah, we know all about that school. That's where this guy who rented the car lives. Hey, you'd better hop up there to the girls' rooms and see if you can find them, Evans. Why don't we Sacramento and get the registration on this license number? Department of Motor Vehicles quickly replies to Captain Gentry's query with the information that license 5E1495 is registered to Dolores Gonzalez at an address on 3rd Street in San Francisco. In the meantime, Detective Evans is calling at the girls' lodging. Yes? You the landlady here? I am. I'm trying to locate Dolores Gonzalez and Mona Martinez. They live here, don't they? Well, they did. What do you mean? They checked out a half hour ago. They did? That's what I said. You know where they went? No. And this ain't no information booth for their boyfriend. Wait a minute. Don't shut that door in my face. I'm not a boyfriend of theirs. I'm a police officer. A police officer? Oh, I always knew them two would get into some kind of trouble. No, they're not in trouble. I want to question them. Well, they ain't here. I told you that. Are you sure of that? Sure, I'm sure of it. Oh, here's the money they paid the rent with. Here, just a minute. Let me see that dough. Hmm. New one dollar bill. Five of them. I'll give you a five dollar bill for them. What for? Because I want them. Well, all right, I guess. If your five's good money. Well, if it isn't, you can always find me at the police station. Look here. You said something about the boyfriends of these two girls. Did they have many? Oh, it wasn't the number. Was the kind there was. What do you mean? Oh, a couple of sheiks used to hang around here most of the time. What did they look like? They was Mexican. One was sort of dark and the other was lighter, with curly hair. Ah, uh, you don't have a picture of them, do you? Why should I have a picture of them? Well, I, I just wondered. Did the girls have any pictures of them? Ah, uh, they was always taking pictures. That Dolores girl had a roll of film in her hand today when she paid me the rent. Oh, she did? Yes, yeah, she did. Look here, I don't see where this is getting anybody, and I got a lot of work to do. Quite all right. You've told me all I want to know. Why, well, I haven't told you a thing. That's what you think. Thanks very much. Good day. Well, I declare. The landlady's dollar bill bear the same serial numbers as the money issued to Mrs. Nargo. Every drugstore and Kodak store in San Pedro is searched for the roll of film. Every traffic policeman and motorcycle patrolman is furnished with the number of the Chrysler Coupe on their daily hot sheet of wanted cars. San Francisco police are asked to watch for the two girls in the Coupe and police in Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, every town between San Francisco and Los Angeles are requested to be on the lookout. The following morning, Lieutenant Barlow, police department fingerprint expert, sends his report to Captain Gentry, who is opening it just as Evans bursts into his office. Well, here they are. What? Why, the missing pictures. Where'd you get them? Picked them up at the Green Cross drugstore. They were in the name of that Gonzalez girl. Oh, that's swell. Let's say, look here. Barlow reports that the prints on that car are the same as those of Paul Jujula, alias J. Colano. Well, I'll be. Used his old aliases when he rented the car. Yep. He's on parole now after serving time for a robbery job in 1928. Huh, up to his old tricks again, eh? Looks like it. Let's say. <laughs> Here's a kick. Yeah? <laughs> oh, this is good. His address entered on his police record is 83283. At school again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's have a look at those pictures. Yeah, here they are. Two women and two guys. Hmm. Well, so far so good. They fit the description. Yeah, here's the wavy-haired one wearing the gray suit and the darker one in the blue suit. Yeah, and look at this. The wavy 
gray-haired one poses full face with one of the dames in this picture, and then in this one he poses profile. <laughs> That's as good as shooting him for the mug book. If we can find a mug on him, it'll be a cinch to identify him. Well, one of these guys is Colano. The question is, which one? Better get Barlow to send you his mug. I'll do that right away. And you take these snaps over to the island and see if you can get an identification from the Japanese woman. Oh, yeah, and you'd better stop in on that landlady and the parking station manager. See if they recognize him, too. Right. Mrs. Nago, the distraught victim of the robbery, is doubtful in her identification of the man in the blue suit, but is certain that the one in the gray suit is the same as the criminal who seized her money. The landlady identifies the curly-haired man as Delores' boyfriend, and the darker one as Mona's sweetie. The manager of the auto-renting park identifies the darker suspect as Colano, the man who rented the car. But the police are stopped when they try to identify the curly-haired man in the gray suit. Then the next day, as traffic officer L.H. Bowden stands his watch at 6th and Spring in Los Angeles. Hey, buddy. What about that green suit going down Spring? Okay, jump on. What's up? Well, I wanted a car, and I didn't stop. Well, you can't get through that traffic on 5th. Here we are. Now pull over to the curb. Who, oh, me? Yes, you. The big idea of not stopping when I blew my whistle. Were you whistling at me? Yes, I was. No, Dolores never stop when men whistle at her. Well, she better stop when the man wears a badge. I've got to put you girls under arrest. Arrest? What for? Well, we stop with that light back there. Yeah, I know. It ain't that. This car is wanted. Wanted by who? Wanted by the police. Oh, but this is my car. It's not stolen. It's mine. Hey, we ain't done nothing. I can't help that, girls. i got to take you in. <laughs> Loudly protesting their innocence, the two girls are booked at Central Station and then transferred to San Pedro, where they are questioned. Ah, oh, come on, boys. What's the big idea of pinching Dolores and me? We ain't done nothing. Nobody said you have, Mona. We just want to ask you some questions, that's all. Oh. Yeah, and show you some pictures. Pictures? What kind of pictures? Oh, some friends of yours. Some friends of mine? Who? Did you ever see this guy before? He? Um... No, never saw him before in my life. Sure of that? How come he's posing with you in this shot? Oh, I... Say, what's the idea of copying our pictures, Oh, you can have them back after we're through with them. Sure you can. But right now, we're interested in this guy in the picture with you. Pretty cheeky-looking boyfriend, ain't he, Mona? (laughs) Yeah, he's okay. But he ain't mine. No? Who's is he? Dolores. We just pose that way for fun. Yeah? Who took the picture? Dolores. Sure it wasn't this guy. Why, uh... Who's that? Oh, come on, Mona. You wouldn't fool us now, would you? I don't know who he is. I never saw him before. Well, how about you, Dolores? We found a money order for $25 in your purse. Made out to a Julia Gonzalez in Puerto Rico and signed by Ignacio Gonzalez. Who is this Ignacio Gonzalez, Dolores? Your brother? I haven't got any brothers. He's just a friend of mine. How come you got the money order? He asked me to send it. How did you pay for it? The new dollar bills? What do you mean? Maybe the dollar bill was taken from that poor Japanese woman a couple of days ago on the island, eh? Say, what are you trying to pull off? I don't know nothing about no new dollar bills or hold up. Who is Ignacio Gonzalez, Dolores? Just a friend of mine. Is this a picture of him? Madre, how did you... Never mind how we got him. Who is this man in the gray suit? Is this Ignacio Gonzalez? No, I tell you, I never saw him before. Well, your must have. Well, here's a picture of your friend Mona and him, and Mona tells us you took the picture. Now, who is this, Chief Dolores? What's his name? Well, we, uh, we call him Buddy. That's the only name we know. He's uh, a friend. He's been visiting down here from San Francisco. But it ain't done nothing. You can't pin anything on him. <laughs> that the man in gray is the same Ignacio Gonzalez, whose name appears on the money order in Dolores' purse, Captain Gentry has Los Angeles and San Francisco check their mug books for the man. 
A couple of days later, the records from San Francisco arrive, and the police pictures check with the snapshot. After four days, the girls are released for insufficient evidence and declare they are leaving for San Francisco at once. Gentry asks the San Francisco police to keep a lookout for the girls' coupé and also to watch the Gonzales girls' address in the northern city. A week later, as detectives George P. Wafer and P.H. Keneally are cruising the waterfront in a radio car looking for stolen automobiles, they pick up Dolores and Mona parked in their Chrysler coupé. They arrest the girls on suspicion of robbery, send them to the station, and remain on watch near the Chrysler. Shortly, a big sedan comes up beside the coupé. Hey, Delores, what are you doing? You're sleeping? Just a minute, boys. We want to talk to you. Hey, stop. We're police officers. Threading their way at breakneck speed through the narrow streets around the waterfront, the police car follows the fleeing sedan. Goes past is the pace of the police car and smashes into the rear fender of the sedan before it can be stopped. Well, this baby won't run away anymore. Dead? Look at him, four bullets in the head. Yeah, but there was two. Where's the other one? He must have jumped out as they hit the curb. Come on, he can't be far away. In the wrecked car, detectives Wafer and Keneally find the body of Kalein, apparently shot at the wheel as he sought to escape. But Ignacio Gasalis had escaped in the darkness, and although police scoured the vicinity, he was not found. But so extensively did we advertise for him, and so persistent was our search that nearly a year, year later, when he was admitted to a hospital in Stockton for treatment of a minor injury, he was promptly recognized and arrested. Gonzalez was a confirmed criminal who had been arrested 11 times in five years. This time he was convicted on a charge of first-degree robbery, and it is doubtful if the parole board will again release such a habitual offender from his present home in San Quentin Penitentiary. Thank you, Chief Seeger. <laughs> Gentlemen, Chief Seeger has been talking tonight to an audience of millions of people, which includes many boys and girls who are anxious to help the police departments of their cities enforce the laws and capture criminals. The Rio Grande Junior Police Department has enrolled hundreds of thousands of these boys and girls on the side of law and order. Rio Grande supplies police badges, detective microscopes, fingerprint outfits, and other detective and G-man paraphernalia free to all members. We invite every boy and girl listening tonight to join. See the Rio Grande dealer in your neighborhood and ask how you can get your detective outfit free. And parents, bring your youngsters with you when you drive in for Rio Grande cracks gasoline. While they're enrolling for crime prevention, why don't you enroll for accident prevention? Now is the time to lubricate for safety, and your Rio Grande dealer is equipped to give your car scientific Sinclair lubrication. This is entirely different from the ordinary grease job you usually get. Sinclair engineers have worked with the manufacturers of your car, of every car, and both have agreed upon a certain Sinclair oil or lubricant for every moving part. Sinclair lubrication is the kind your car maker specifies. Sinclair makes over 120 different oils and greases to ensure that your car is scientifically and correctly lubricated. All Rio Grande cracked gasoline dealers are equipped and trained to give your car Sinclair scientific lubrication, the kind that prevents accidents. Officer Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a camp place and broadcast six. Respect described this broadcast are now in custody. That's all. Roll the clerk.
This is Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs>